John then, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watching with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you might not enter into the temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. As we talk briefly um, about the cross as it applies to our sin, uh, if we look at the Bible, the Bible in all of its complexity, the Bible in all of its various um, authors have written over a vast period of time is can be a very simple uh, book. If we boil it down to its very basics, the Bible is a story about man and a story about God. And the Bible has a good bit to say about both man and God. While uh, it's not uncommon to encounter somebody in our community or this day and age that believes that man is nothing more than a, a animal, a a dressed up a savage, um, an evolved creature. The Bible tells quite a different story about man. From its very early pages, the Bible tells us that man is created in the very image of God. That man is and was created good for the intentions of good. Uh, but the Bible also uh, tells us what went wrong with man. The Bible speaks greatly of this thing called sin. It speaks in great volumes of the separation that we have between us and God on account of man, not God. It talks about how man chose to worship and serve himself rather than his creator. You see, I've never met anyone that denies the reality of sin. I've never met anyone that says evil doesn't exist, that it's not a thing. Even an atheist can agree that, that evil, that bad things happen to good people, that there's corruption all across the world, that there's something deeply wrong, except for the naturalist, the person that thinks that probably wouldn't tell me that something's wrong. They'd probably tell me that that's the reality we live in, a world where we're evolved animals and we're going to behave like animals. But the Bible says something very, very different about it. This thing we call sin. The Bible teaches us that sin, uh, our lawlessness, our pride, our strife, our anger, that all of these things are results of our separation from God. In the passage I read to you, Jesus is quite distressed. It says that he's sad even to the point of death. And he's praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And the question uh, that we have to ask is, what is this cup that he's talking about? And the cup has been referenced before earlier in Matthew um, that we studied. And this cup is nothing less than what we have created. This cup is a symbol of the sin that we have created. It's a symbol of the wrath that is due to the sin that we have made, not that God has made. So the question then really is, is why in this passage of Scripture, why is Jesus the one with the cup? Why is he the one? He's the one who Matthew already told us earlier in the book that the winds and the seas obey his command, that he teaches as one having authority. And yet here is he with praying that the cup might pass. And he says, not as I will, but as your will be done. You see, it's funny that here in this passage that Jesus is the one with the cup and that he wants it to pass. He says, but not my will be done, but your will be done. See, the reality of it is, is that our sin separates us from God. 
The reality of it is, is that this watch that you saw in the video, there was nothing he could do to get rid of it. There's nothing we can do to rid ourselves from this thing called sin. We can try to run from it. We can try to escape it over time. We can try to deny its very existence. But the reality of it is, is that apart from God, there's nothing that we can do. I'm sure you're aware of that. I'm sure you um, have woken up or gone to bed at night with thoughts on your mind that you are hoping they'd be gone uh, in the morning with realities, mistakes that you've made, decisions that you've done, and they're still there in the back of your mind, lingering. But the reality of it is, is this cup, this wrath of God, because God is this just God. God can't just wish away your sin. It has to be justly dealt with. He's a just king. He's a righteous king. Much of the Old Testament uh, speaks of this day of reckoning that is coming, that the Lord, uh, Yahweh, that the God of hosts will have his day of reckoning. He will have rightly restored to him what is to come, that his wrath will indeed be a reality. And here's the deal. The cup is what we should be drinking. The cup is meant for us. And the one who has it, the one who's taking it on, is Jesus. You see, on the cross, Jesus bore our sins. And they're nailed to the cross, and we bear it no more. Because the cross is the just. It's justified on the cross. And this speaks volumes of our God. It speaks volumes of who he is. That he would uh, become like us, first of all. But then to do that, and that sin is no more. Uh, Paul, the apostle, tells us that if we have died to sin... If we've died to sin because Jesus has died to sin, that we should also uh, be raised in the newness of life. I'm talking to a group of people who chances are you sinned yesterday. I'd be willing to bet you sinned today. And I'm no prophet, but I'd probably guess that tomorrow... You'll probably sin. So we have questions that we have to ask ourselves. Why? Is sin fully dealt with on the cross? I still struggle with sin. I still do this stuff. Does Jesus and God, do they know it? Does he know what he's doing? But the reality of it is, is that God has died for our sins. That he has paid the debt in full. And that we are justified by the righteousness of Christ. That it's just as if we've never sinned, just as if we've always perfectly obeyed. So I don't know what's going on in your life. Uh, I'm not 100% aware of the sins that, that you face. You are. You know. And if you don't, if you pray, the Holy Spirit will reveal them to you. That's the good part. Uh, but in light of that, what you're going through... Um, Know that it has been put to the cross. That it's been nailed to the cross. And that that sin doesn't define you anymore. That if you are a co-heir and conqueror with Christ, you are defined by the righteousness of him. Not by what you've done, by what he has done. And what has he done? He's nailed your sins to the cross. And you bear it no more. His, his, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. So, just a real glorious truth. The good news that you have is that Lewis gets to preach on this in two weeks. So, so there you go. But well, let me pray for us and then we'll keep going. Uh, Father, we come before you, God, grateful. Grateful, God, that we can worship you. God, what a glorious truth that our sins have been nailed to the cross. God, that we have died to sin. 
because you died to sin once and for all, then death, you died, you died once and for all. And the life you live, you live forever. And God, you invited us to partake in that. God, may we never forget the cross. God, may we never get over the cross. God, may we never look past the cross for it. And so, God, we pray that indeed you would be glorified. God, that indeed you'd be magnified in our songs. God, in the words we say and the meditations of our hearts. God, your word teaches us that you know our hearts and yet you love us the same. God, you're not a God who does things halfway. You didn't halfway die for our sins. You didn't halfway give us new life. You're not halfway restoring us. You're not halfway bringing us into life. God, you've done it all in full. God, this is all that you have done and nothing we have done. Thanks be to God. I wish we pray in His name. Amen. turn to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Now, I'm the one that did this. I gave me and Z, I gave us 10 minutes each. And then I went and chose Romans 6, 11 through 23. And y'all, I'm telling you, this scripture, this passage, is like six weeks worth of stuff. <laughs> Bold into 10 minutes, though, man. 10 minutes for Alright? So, Romans chapter 6. And what, what I'm going to focus on, as I alluded to earlier, as he has talked about, is um, what now? And as we talk, as we learned, and focus on the fact that uh, through the cross, uh, Jesus has defeated sin, crushed sin, um, and, and, and keep in mind, as we talk about the cross, we are also, we can't separate it from resurrection. You know, we can't separate it from the fact that resurrection seals the deal of what happens on the cross. So, so don't think we're trying to separate these two things. But, but there is power in what happened on the cross. 
Uh, we're not talking about that there's power in a cross, okay? But we're talking about the power of what is transacted on the cross through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so as we, as we learn and have learned and have been reminded that the cross has crushed and, and defeated sin once and for all, the question now that, that I'll attempt to answer as we look at this scripture in Romans chapter 6 is, what then for us? What, what does that mean, practically speaking, in our lives? What, what does that mean that I should look for? What, what, is my, what should my life look like then as I recognize the reality of sin being crushed? Because I know, just as Z talked about, and just as you and I both understand, that sin is still a reality in, in, in our lives. So, why is that? And, and, and what, what should be done? What should be the application that we look for? So there, there are a few things that, that we're going to see as we go through this passage that the cross does for us as, as it applies to our life. Look at verse 11 of chapter 6. It says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so what he's talking about here, being alive to God in Christ Jesus, is, is the fact that of, of what Christ has done on the cross. And so we see here clearly that one of the things that the cross does is it makes us alive. The cross makes us alive. And, and he says that we are dead to sin. We are dead to sin. And so notice that what he doesn't say, that he doesn't say that sin is dead, does he? Paul doesn't write that sin is dead. He says that we are dead to sin. So what, what does this look like in our lives? Well, the, the reality is, is that it's kind of like maybe you've seen movies. Unfortunately, maybe some people have heard this in, in real life because um, it happens in real life sometimes when perhaps a, a child does something and a parent will say, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. Certainly, you've probably seen it in a movie when, when something happens and, and one character says to another, you are dead to me. And, and the idea goes with it that the person is saying, I, I'm going to have nothing else to do with you. But the reality is that person can't unknow the person that they're saying is dead to them, can they? They can't unknow them. They, they have known them for some time, and they still know them. They're just saying that there, there's no interaction. I'm not going to have any more interaction with you. And that's one of the applications that I think we can, we can take to this that, that says when we are dead to sin, it's as if sin is saying, you're dead to me. You're dead to me, Lewis. You're dead to me, Johnny. You're dead to me, Hunter. This is what sin says when we become what? When we become alive to God. You see, there's this transaction that takes place. And the transaction is that we go, we become dead to sin and alive to God. Kind of like we were talking in Colossians the other week. There, there's this transaction, there's this transfer. We go from something to something. So we're, we're dead to sin, but we're alive to God. And, 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 and sin says, I recognize. The reason sin would say, the reason Satan would say, you're dead to me, is that he knows the truth. He knows the truth that he has been crushed. He has been defeated. Not the ultimate defeat. We know he's still running loose on this earth. But he knows the reality. And so the reality is that I no longer truly have control. Of I no longer am the master of your life. He recognizes that as a reality. So often we fail to. We fail to recognize it. We fail to recognize it. Because just as Blaine got with his watch in that video, we get so comfortable with it. We're, we're, we're comfortable with it, used to the way that, that we've always lived. We're, we're used to the way that the crowd lives. We'll see another video in a minute. But, you know, we, we become accustomed to the way we used to live. We become accustomed to the way that everyone else lives. And we just think, well, I have no choice. But the scripture here tells me otherwise. The scripture tells me that not just am I dead to sin, but I'm alive 
to God. I'm alive to God. The cross makes me alive to God. And when I recognize that I'm alive to God, it opens the door. It opens the door for a world of possibilities about how then this life should look. How then I, I should live this life. And you get down into verses 12 and 13 and we see that it gets a little more specific here. Therefore, since, since you're alive to God now and, and dead to sin, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And so the, the, the first thing that, that Paul tells us here that as we make this application of being alive to God is in everyday terms, he says, well, stop acting like you used to act. Stop acting like you're still this instrument of unrighteousness. Because that's not you anymore. That's not who you are. So stop acting like that. Stop acting like you're this unrighteous person. You've been made different. You are now an instrument of righteousness. You might look the same for all practical purposes, sound the same, have the same job, live in the same house, have the same patterns of everyday life, but you're different now. It's just like I can pick up a hammer. I can use that hammer and I can break a window and break into somebody's house. Or I can take that hammer and I can hammer in nails and build a house. You see how easily that hammer can go from a, a tool or an instrument of unrighteousness, unusefulness, to a tool or an instrument of righteousness, of doing something good and worthwhile. That's what Paul says here happens to us as a result of the work accomplished on the cross. That when it's applied to us, when we surrender to it, this is, this is what happens to us then. We go from an instrument of unrighteousness to an instrument of righteousness, of, of, of doing things that reveal that we are alive to God. That we have a new master. Check out what he says in the next few verses. Starting in verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And so, one of the things that's interesting that Paul is saying here is, remember now, you're dead to sin. Sin has said, I recognize that I, sin has said, I recognize that reality is I no longer have a right to control you. I'm not your master anymore. That's what sin has said. So how foolish of it, of, of you and me, to go around acting like someone who says I'm not your master anymore, and I'm saying, I'm still a slave to sin. I'm acting like, and you and I act like, we can act like we're still slaves to this thing, slaves to this entity, slaves to sin, which is acknowledged that I am no longer your master. How foolish is that? How strange is that? How are you going to act like you're a slave to someone who says, I no longer have it? Here you go. I don't want to go. I want to stay. I mean, that, that's, what this, that's what this silly picture looks like. And that's what it can so often look like in our lives.
why we still, why we do that. Why we can still act like we're slaves to sin, slaves to unrighteousness, is because we don't check out the other part of the language that's in these verses. So often all we do in practical purposes is say, all right, I'm going to try to stop being a slave to sin. I'm going to try to stop this. And we don't do the transfer. We don't recognize and embrace this beautiful language then that what he, what he has said is that you're no longer a slave to sin. You're now a slave to God. You're a slave to obedience. You're a slave to righteousness. Does your life, does my life, when I examine it, when I'm truly examining it, does my life look like I'm a slave to righteousness? And I'm not saying that most of us, if we look at our lives, we look like we're slaves to unrighteousness. But we're kind of somewhere in here. You know, we're just kind of hanging out here. Just rolling nice and jellyfish. That's where we are. We're just kind of here. We're, you know, I'm not, I'd never be, I'd never want to be a slave to unrighteousness, a slave to sin. I, no, oh, no, no. But I haven't gone all the way. I haven't gone all the way with, with what, what he writes here and says that I am a slave to righteousness. I am a slave to obedience. I am a slave to God. What stops you? What stops you from doing that? What stops me from doing that? You know what stops us? We stop ourselves. We stop ourselves in so many ways. So many ways we stop ourselves. We stop ourselves because of pride, because we think, you know, that, hey, I, I, can, I can hold this off by myself. I, I can do this in my own power. But that's not the word of Scripture at all. Scripture says you have a new master. We have a new master. It's not just that we've gotten rid of the old one. But we've got a new one. We've got a new master. And we've got to start acting like it. The last thing that, that we'll talk about, verses 20 through 23, we're going to see that the cross, it, it, it draw the distinction. First thing we say is that the cross makes us alive. Last thing we're going to see is that the cross gives us eternal life. And, and, I'm, and I'm telling you today there's a difference. Because it's a, the, as we talk about the cross making us alive, it's more as a uh, and I'm talking about it today as it more pertains to our everyday lives, the way I'm walking, the way I'm talking, the way I'm living today. And when we talk about eternal life, yeah, that starts upon justification. That starts upon the time that I surrender. But we do have more of a look to the time when we, when we pass on. Look at verses 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you than deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed. For the outcome of those things is death. You see, that when you were a slave to sin, there was no benefit because the, the, the end of that, the end game of being a slave to sin is death. The end game of living a life as a slave to sin is death, eternal death. Verse 22, but now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, there's that language again, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, here's the, the, the ultimate payoff, the ultimate application of the cross is eternal life. I've been, I've been freed, I've been transferred from the outcome of, of sin, which is death, and transferred then to, to having eternal life. What, what, what a payment, what, what, what a benefit that comes from the cross. But I only get that when I'm surrendered to it. I only get that when I, when I, when I become a slave God. When I follow God and not the crowd. I'm going to show that to The crowd of the cross. Unrighteousness or righteousness. Disobedience or obedience. 
sin or God? Who are you going to be a slave to is the, is the question. Am I going to continue acting like I'm a slave to sin? Or is my life going to start reflecting that I'm a slave to God and a slave to righteousness? What will my life look like? What will be the best reflection of what's really going on in my heart? And guys, we're, we're, we're going to have a, we're going to give it an opportunity tonight to we're going to sing one final song and yeah, respond, sing, stand, sing, stand, and pray. Come to this altar and pray. I mean, if, if there are things you've got to examine, if, if if you're recognizing tonight that you're here that that you haven't, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be the slave to sin. But you recognize that you've been trying that in your own power. That's the reality of it. And you haven't really become a slave to God. And I invite you, I encourage you. The answer, the answer is here. Make it right. Make it right. Become a slave to God tonight. Make it known. Let's stand. Let's respond.